think we can get started, Linda. Okay. Oh, I'd like to welcome everyone here today um, into the traditional territory of the Squamish and the unceded territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh and Musqueam peoples. I'd like to start off with the opening prayer. So if we could lower our gaze and um, giving thanks to our dear creator and our loving ancestors for the blessings that we have received today and will receive today through this Zoom. I, oh great spirit who made all races, look kindly upon the whole human family and take away any of the arrogance and the hatred which spreads, separates us from our brothers. And for this, I pray that each day it will become easier in whom so that we could all be together. For this I pray. If I can, I'd just like to maybe say a few words on uh, today's topic. To me, I find this really like uh, complex and like, where do I start? But yet it's heartbreaking and heartfelt because there's so much time that has been going on through hard times and figuring out how did we get here and how did we do this as a people. It makes me think of colonization, or at least in my opinion, how colonization has destroyed some of us, some of our human beings. Um, just to feel superior, that's in my mind. This myth is based on so many stereotypes. Um, what comes to my mind? as a First Nation elder, I think of even the littlest thing that had the biggest impact. Um, when I was in Indian day school, we were learning how to spell, and I must've been about seven, and I, we were learning how to spell arithmetic. So the way that we were taught how to spell arithmetic was, a red Indian thought he might eat tobacco in church, spells arithmetic. You know, so um, all of the stereotypes that we have lived with as First Nations people uh, were useless, were lazy, shiftless, uh, lazy, drunken Indians or First Nations people. You know, how great is that, right? Um, and when I look at uh, people of all different colors, there's so many levels of racism. I remember non-native people saying, yeah, you just have to drive down Hastings Street and you can see all the Indians down there that you wanna see. You know? One of my sons, his friends weren't even allowed to come see him on the reserve or anything. You know, And these are just some of the things that still carry on the silent ones You know that um, people of color have to live with. I come from um, our Hohotmish teachings and we practice chiach, which is our unwritten laws. And this is how we conduct ourselves from birth to death. We teach our young ones about our snawayath, and those are our guiding principles. And they are based around spirituality to guide, to protect, to provide for all of our people. It's based on promises, it's based on respect. It's really based on, based on respect for mothers and women, fathers and men, love, caring, sharing, nurturing, and to be humble. And my thoughts are that this is the core way of being, and it has been lost in our world today due to colonization and the issues of power and greed, wealth and status has taken over. It's taken away from who we are from the heart. I can only pray that we as human beings continue to make change no matter how small the change is for now and into the future. It can be done if each and every one of us strive to make that little bit of change because we believe in it and we see it happening around the world with young people stepping up into the forefront. These are just some of my thoughts that came to my mind as I was reflecting, getting ready for today's Zoom. 
And then with that, I turn it back over to um, Amiko Chenquinman Tomi. I thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. We are very, very grateful that you have agreed to open our, our session today and share your lovely words with us. And thank you for sharing that prayer at the beginning as well. So really, really honored to have you with us. Thank you. And welcome everyone. This is Deconstructing the Model Minority Myth it is the final session in our four-part anti-racism series. Kind of hard to believe that we're already at the very last workshop. And um, some of you who are joining us here today have been with us since the very beginning, since January. So we are really so, so grateful. Um, and, if, and if today is your first time joining us, um, hello and welcome. My name is Emiko Newman. I am the workshop coordinator and I will be facilitating today's session. So before I share the outline for this workshop, I'm going to pass it over to a very special person, Judy Hanazawa. She is the president of the Greater Vancouver Japanese Canadian Citizens Association. So over to you, Judy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Emmy. And thank you so much, uh, Squamish Elder Linda George, for your prayer and your kind guidance and your uplifting words uh, and for giving us permission for this workshop to take place on the unceded territory of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh and Musqueam people. Your presence is so appreciated. And welcome to all participants who have Zoomed in this afternoon. Uh, today's workshop on deconstructing the model minority myth personal relates to many of us who are attending today. And I encourage you to offer your thoughts if you are comfortable doing so, as I believe we can learn much from each other. And with everyone else, I look forward to listening to the valuable information offered by our amazing speakers, Dr. Audrey Kobayashi and Eli Shiner. Thank you, Dr. Audrey and Eli for being with us today. And thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judy. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen. Share. Here we go. So here is today's schedule. We are so honored to have with us two incredible speakers, Dr. Audrey Kobayashi and Eli Oda Shiner. So Dr. Kobayashi will be speaking first followed by Eli, and then we will be going into a five minute break. After the break, we will be coming back and we will be going into breakout rooms. And we really do encourage you to stay for that second half if you're able to. The breakout rooms will be a chance for people to meet in smaller groups and get to know one another and share your thoughts and ask any questions you may have. So by all means, please stay with us for the session. And after the breakout rooms, we will be concluding with a group discussion and our conclusion. So we should be finishing up um, around 3 p.m. So as always, just some housekeeping notes for everyone. If it's possible, could you please change your Zoom name so that it matches the name that you registered with? Once the speakers start talking, I'm going to be madly putting people into breakout rooms. So it would help me a lot if if you can update your name. And feel free to put any questions or comments that you have in the chat and hopefully we'll be able to address those at the end. And so finally, and most importantly, before we get into our speakers, we hope that everyone will leave today's session feeling a little bit more inspired, a little bit more empowered and a little bit more educated about anti-racism. After all, these were the three goals of our series. I'm just gonna stop sharing. Um, okay. 
So this last session is taking place in May and May is also Asian Heritage Month. This session is also taking place in the context of a significant rise in anti-Asian hate crimes. So I'm sure this is kind of a difficult time for people. There's a lot going on. Statistics have shown that anti-Asian racism has risen 700%, which is not insignificant. So this is a very serious issue. And we want to thank all of you for, for coming and joining us today so that we can talk about these things that are happening. And also so that we can hopefully start working towards um, ways to move forwards to, into the future. And I would like to reiterate that this workshop is guided by kindness, respect, and safety. We will be discussing topics that could be triggering or emotional, so please do feel free to step away and take a little breather at any time. And without further ado, I'm very excited to introduce our first speaker of the day, Dr. Audrey Kobayashi. Dr. Kobayashi is a Patricia Montour Distinguished Scholar at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. She has worked in the downtown east side, especially the Powell Street District since the 1970s and has written extensively on the historical geography of the Japanese Canadian community, as well as on a range of issues around social justice and human rights. So Audrey, please take it away. You're mute, on mute, Audrey. There, okay. Thanks so much. It's uh, wonderful to see everyone. I can't see everyone who's here, but I see a few familiar faces there. And I want to start by thanking Emiko and Judy and all of the committee for organizing this great series. And I want to thank Linda for a really thoughtful and meaningful introduction. I'll start by acknowledging that I am here in Kingston um, on Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe traditional territory. Well, the model minority myth has been around for decades. Uh, it's official. Uh, spotlight in the public it is credited with uh, a 1966 article in the New York Times Magazine by the sociologist William Peterson. And it was titled Success Story, Japanese American Style. I know that will make you cringe. Uh, at the time, uh, people got kind of excited and, and they got on the model minority myth uh, bandwagon very easily. Now, uh, Peterson argued that despite the hardships that they'd experienced, Japanese uh, and, and hardships, I mean, of course, the whole events of um, displacement and dispossession during the 1940s, um, Japanese Americans had bounced back, done well, and he cited their successes, uh, their apparent successes in education and living standards. And this idea soon spread to be a story about all Americans of East Asian, sometimes South Asian background in contrast to other racialized groups such as Blacks and Latinx Americans. Uh, it also spread to be used to describe Jewish Americans. And of course it was taken up uh, extensively in Canada as well. So I want to stop for a minute and disentangle or deconstruct, as our title goes, this term. Now, minority has a specific impl implication uh, in the United States, uh, what we now call racialized or marginalized groups. It's not so much about numbers, but about that process of racializing and marginalizing. Um, uh, they then called uh, people racist, which is a rather horrible politically loaded term. The term model implies uh, something positive, something very normative, something that should be emulated or sought after by other groups. Uh, and of course, the best model is white. And that model is also implied. It's the group that can be the most like white people. 
Um, and the term myth, uh, of course, was added. It was just model minority until it became model minority myth more recently. Um, but think about what a myth is. It's a story that's told for a specific social and often moral purpose. And certainly this story has been put to use over the years. The main purpose of the model minority myth was to pit positive stereotypes of Asian Americans uh, or Asian Canadians against other minoritized groups. It uh, was developed at the time of the civil rights movement. I think that's quite important because it argued that issues are not about racism. And uh, they would say, well, if an Asian Americans can rise up and gain admiration, so could others. Uh, and so Asian Americans were also seen as posing less threat to whites because they were deemed to be less political. Um, but of course, all groups at the time, um, and including all Asian groups, uh, were segregated, marginalized in different ways. And the different ways in which those groups were racialized meant that they could be treated differently by the white majority. And of course, the myth traded on inaccuracy, innuendo, sensation, <laughs> sensationalism, um, and of course, ignored facts. And uh, as I say these, this last sentence, it sounds very much like what's been going on, especially in the United States over the last four years. The, the myth ignores systemic racism and the structural barriers that are created for all groups, barriers to education, services, social institutions, etc. But I think a key point is that it did not lessen hatred. And in fact, it was often used inaccurately to foment hatred against Asian Americans and to brand them with other stereotypes, such as sneakiness, lack of compassion, inability to fit into white society, uh, et cetera. And while the details were sometimes couched in positive and sometimes negative stereotypes, uh, they always created expectations that define all people or all racialized groups as different, unassimilar, unassimilable, and never real Americans or real Canadians, uh, creating a set of constructs that erected differences among racialized groups, always against the standard of white supremacy. So by the 1980s, Asian Americans and to a large extent Asian Canadians had also begun their own civil rights movement to overcome racism. And this movement for our community eventually led to the redress settlement. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, I was a graduate student of Harry Kitano, uh, who was then possibly the most accomplished Asian American scholar. And he was on my PhD committee. Uh, but he and many other scholars implicitly brought the myth uh, to the forefront, often writing about how far Japanese Americans had come. Um, and this, this, of course, was the work that I was given as a student. And the result for our community in Canada was that we lived with many ironies, contradictions and contested meanings. So the model minority myth is externally applied but often internalized. Keep your head down, don't make waves, don't stand in solidarity with other racialized groups. Don't stand out, period. Don't whine about racism, just get out there and get an education and rise up. And I'm sure those ideas will sound familiar to many of them. Um, now, of course, the challenge that the myth is not to say don't get an education, but rather don't play into the stereotypes or deny that systemic racism occurs against all racialized groups and continues today. So we're, we're familiar with the particular type of racism in which Asian Canadians are accused of trying to take over the educational system or forsaking other aspects of childhood and social life in order to gain an education. You know, Asian kids don't have any fun. And it, even of playing music without any soul in contrast to blacks who are said to have too much soul. Uh, so you can't win. 
And of course, all of these stereotypes are nonsense and they're unsupported by empirical evidence. But that's not to say that they don't still do harm. They foment and deepen racism in white communities and they have untold effects on self-image and self-esteem among people of Asian heritage. In other words, uh, the model minority myth continues to be believed by many whites and internalized by many Asians. And of course, if we have any doubt about how strongly racism continues, we only have to look at the violent upsurge of hatred, uh, hatred against people of Asian background, especially since uh, the COVID stereotypes were put out there and the increased by 700%. Um, but that was not something new, that was something that escalated. In the 1980s, I was on the committee and I see Mariko Matsu is here, she was another one that negotiated the redress settlement. And the model minority myth was a reality that we fought very hard uh, to withstand, to overcome before the 1988 settlement could occur. Many white people, including politicians, held to the myth and they would deploy it to argue against redress and to deepen div divisions among racialized groups. Basically, what's your problem? You're all doing so well. And many Japanese Canadians um, also internalized the myth at that time and they opposed redress on the grounds that we either didn't deserve it or didn't need it. But also during those years, the damage of the model minority myth became particularly apparent when we held community meetings and realized just how deeply the hurt still flowed among Japanese Canadians. We realized that redress was not just about a monetary settlement, but about healing the very souls of those who had had so much taken from them. And we worked very hard to subdue the effects of the model minority myth in order to promote healing. And I know there are quite a few people here today who were at some of those meetings. Um, so we achieved a certain amount of healing and, and that was a part of the redress settlement. But this past year has been rather disheartening, of course, as we've watched the hatred burgeon um, against all racialized groups. Uh, and it goes far beyond the COVID effect with the strengthening of the far right, especially, but not only in the United States, since as we know, the Proud Boys actually originated in Canada and have been very active here. Uh, and they're still active, notwithstanding government moves against them just recently. So I, I just want to end by saying that I believe that the only way the model minority myth and all forms of racism and hatred will be overcome is by within our community, educating and creating understanding, self-awareness, and a strong commitment to anti-racism but as well outside the community, fostering greater collaboration among racialized groups, continuing the fight for social justice and anti-racism and dispelling not just the model minority myth, but all forms of stereotypes that operate in our society at large. Um, so I'm gonna leave it there and I'm, I will turn it over to Eli and I look very much forward to seeing what he has to say. Thank you, Audrey. That was incredible. So much information shared in such a short time, very succinct. Um, and I fully, fully agree with what you said at the end there about the importance of collaborating among racialized communities um, and trying to dispel not only this model minority myth, but all of the other stereotypes that exist and that are so harmful. So. Thank you so much um, for sharing your wisdom with us. We really appreciate having you with us here today. And we are going to be moving right along to our second speaker of the day, Eli Oda Shiner. Eli is an activist organizer, a PhD candidate in medical anthropology at McGill and a potter. Some of you may even recognize Eli, um, because Eli is one of our GVJCCA anti-racism series committee members and has been doing a great job helping out with preparing all of our 
previous sessions. So we are very excited to have Eli as one of our speakers today. Eli, over to you. Thanks so much, Emiko. I'm going to try to, I'm going to share my screen and it might just take me one second to do it, but maybe I've done it. Can you see it? Yeah, that looks perfect. Okay, cool. Great. Okay, so I'm just going to jump right in. So, I mean, the original title slide for this presentation had a little bit more content in it, like it had my name and my university affiliation. But because you already just heard Emiko mention them, I felt like it was kind of pretentious. So I scrapped them and now uh, there's not much to look at. So apologies, but without further ado, let's just jump right in. So this is kind of something that I like to do with presentations. I like to kind of um, invoke kind of patron saint for the talk. So this here um, is someone called Yuri Kochiyama. Uh, she was an unapologetic Japanese American activist who is hugely involved in the civil rights movement in the 60s, 70s, 80s and onwards. And she was partially famous for being photographed um, cradling Malcolm X in the moments after he was assassinated. And there's actually an iconic picture of that moment. Um, but I've chosen to show this one instead because the other one um, you know, is kind of graphically violent and this one it speaks to me in a different kind of way. So what I wanna emphasize above all else in this picture um, beyond the obvious diversity of the subjects who are, who are photographed is the kind of palpable look of joy on, on Kochiyama's face. Um, which I find is, is just infectious and you can't really help but feel it. So the point of my talk is, is to try to complement Audrey's talk by throwing the min minority myth into productive kind of friction with another Asian trope that also shapes Asian experience, um, but that erupts in different historical moments and in different degrees. Um, so first I'll offer a bit of context on what I'm going to present. Then I'm going to talk about how the model minority myth is kind of bookended in ways by the trope of yellow parallelism. Um, so I'm going to talk about a kind of before and after, but while I think the before holds in a lot of ways, I'm going to trouble this idea of there really being an after to the model minority myth. I think it's an ongoing thing. Um, but then I'll get into whether we can try to pit these two tropes against one another in order to try to do away with both of them. So just in getting into this, I'm aware of the fact that the model minority myth, as Audrey kind of alluded to, is really pan-Asian in its scope. Um, and to that extent, part of its violence is its ability to collapse a lot of difference across Asian cultures. So to make really a homogenous category out of what's in truth an unassimilable range of diversity. So although I'm addressing the myth uh, you know, as a pan-Asian construct, because that's really its scope, um, for the for the purpose of the talk, I'll be drawing mostly from the more particular histories of, of Japanese um, Canadian people because that's my area of experience. Um, and also because the notion of the Japanese Canadian has been kind of an organizing principle uh, for this workshop series or along with the idea of anti-racism. You know, we've been trying to, to bring these ideas into conversation. So with that in mind, I'm hoping to try to unsettle or shake up the concept of, the, of a Japanese Canadian person rather than to reify it um, because the kinds of histories that have shaped uh, this umbrella term also participate in the shaping of other kind of equally troublesome terms um, like the term oriental. Uh, so this image here is from a 1932 directory from the city of Vancouver. Um, it lists the names of the heads of households at each address on every street. And the bottom entry on the list is my obacha, my grandmother's home, um, where rather than listing her family name, it simply just reads Orientals at 1324 Franklin. So my, my stomach really turned the first time that I saw this listing and not entirely because I was surprised, um, but, but more because it kind of concretized, it made plain and almost mundane, uh, what, I had, what I had registered more, more abstractly um, about the violent lumping together of so much uh, diversity and so much life. And what I wanna call attention to right now is the fact that the current moment we're living through actually resonates in a lot of ways with the genre of racism that, that I'm pointing to in this image. Um, and in many ways it's at odds with the model minority myth. So I think that there's a kind of attention 
between the ways um, or the myth of Asian people characterized as exemplary versus the myth of Asian people characterized as kind of a societal threat. Um, they contradict one another, while at the same time they contribute to, to stereotyped and racialized characterizations of Asian people. So, so the model minority, it, did, it didn't always is, exist and it doesn't always preside over Asian experience. And what I mean by that is that we can't let the model minority myth monopolize the way that we understand Asian racial, racialization. So I think it's probably more helpful to understand it as a story that emerged at a specific point in history that you know Audrey uh, elucidated over the course of her talk and that tangles with other stories that also shape the way um, that Asians are perceived, as well as a range of um, you know, political and kind of existential horizons that are available to them. I um, mean, the most significant discourse that it tangles with um, predates the emergence of the model minority myth, and that's the story of the yellow peril. Um, so yellow perilism designates the perceived threat that people of Asian descent pose to North American settlers at the turn of the century and racist ideologies meshed with perceived threats to, to, white, to the white labor force at the time in the, in the province of British Columbia and led to the formation of organizations uh, who were mandated to oppose supposed racial and, and economic dangers that were being represented by Asian immigrants. So they were championed by labor leaders and powerful politicians and these organizations successfully lobbied for the creation of legal and societal restrictions on Asian employment, housing, education, civic participation, and more. So the image on the left here is a membership card from the Asiatic Exclusion League, whose um, objective was, I quote, to work for the exclusion from the Dominion of Canada, its territory and its possessions, all Asiatics by the enforcement uh, of an act similar to the Natal Act. And the image on the right there um, which in light of this kind of the ways that I've been, you know, processing yellow parallelism is, is an image of Steveston, um, which I never really registered. I always kind of had a romantic idea of what Steveston was at the turn of the century. Um, but beyond that, it's, you know, it's also pretty clear that it was a segregated community. Um, so the activities of these xenophobic groups reached in a kind of initial peak on September 7th in 1907. And on this day, an anti-Oriental parade was organized before the opening of an Oriental Exclusion League meeting that took place at Vancouver City Hall. So a crowd of several thousand people formed and a portion of the crowd set their sights on the Chinese and Japanese communities. Um, they formed a, a mob um, and they were waving thousands of small banners uh, labeled for a white Canada. So the following uh, is, is a small excerpt from a newspaper article written just two days after the event. Um, so I'll read it now. While in the front, the police were pushing and crowding the mob back, bricks and stones came flying from the rear over their heads. It was in this stronghold of the Japanese that the besieged showed fight. Armed with sticks, clubs, iron bars, revolvers, knives, and broken glass, bottles, the enraged aliens poured forth into the street as soon as the limit of their patience had been reached. Hundreds of little brown men rushed the attacking force, their most effective weapons being the knives and bottles, the latter of which being broken off the neck, which was held in the hands of the Jap fighter. The broken edges of glass clustering around the necks of the bottles made the weapons very formidable, and many a white man was badly gashed about the arms, face, and neck. Armed with only stones, the mob could not stand before the onslaught of knives and broken bottles propelled by the Japanese while they made the air ring with bonsais. Many of the Japanese went to the ground as stones thumped against their heads, but the insensible ones were carried off by friends and the fight kept up till the mob wavered, broke and finally retreated. Um, so that's an article from the Daily Province on September 9th, 1907. So what I want to what I want to highlight about that is obviously the the severity of the anti Asian sentiment that we can detect like the the obvious cringiness now as you know as Audrey mentioned, um, but also to draw attention to the way that Asian people and Japanese people more specifically were characterized as threatening, um, which is something that doesn't really accord with the with the model minority myth, um, and you know the height of this anti Asian sentiment culminates in. For, Japanese, for the Japanese community and internment um, in 1942, but that's kind of a whole other story and it's been dealt with more thoroughly in other sessions. So I'm 
I'm going to move on. Um, the end of internment, along with the end of the Second World War, marked a pretty major turning point um, and a shift in Canada's strategic approach to the Japanese. So at this time, the Japanese com Canadian community was offered a kind of ultimatum. Are you Japanese or are you Canadian? Um, the answer was the former. Um, the solution was for you to go back to Japan. The answer was the latter. The solution was to become Canadian, um, to, to cease to be Japanese. So this ultimatum was delivered at a time of relative socialism in Canada. So I'm thinking when I say this of the general kind of progressivism of the post-war era, of the introduction of things like healthcare and other socialized initiatives. So in other words, the conditions existed for the successful economic assimilation of the Japanese. So by point of contrast, I wanna to point to the experience of later migrants who arrive in North America, especially the United States, um, at a time when the public educational system is deteriorating, where healthcare is prohibitively expensive and minimum wage jobs can't cover the basic costs of living. Um, and under these conditions, the lure of assimilation is far less tempting. Um, and so it plays out very, very differently. But you know, to get back to the story at hand, the Japanese Canadian ultimatum to, um, you know, to become Canadian is obviously at odds with a segregationist approach. And I think that without being fully aware of what we we're being led into, um, we, we made a kind of Faustian pact, which is also something known as a kind of a deal with the devil. Um, so through, through our economic assimilation, we accessed a formerly prohibited, so what was like before unavailable degree of class mobility. And so with it, um, the threat of Asian sociality, the, you know, the threat of those Japanese um, mobs with the, with the broken bottles became neutralized, yet, as Audrey mentioned, our otherness still remained. And I think it, at this point, it remained less in the form of a threat, but more uh, in the genre of a kind of exotic appeal, um, which made us available for a kind of consumption. Um, so I think this, this marks a kind of shift in the balance of the way that we are racialized as Japanese people. So before um, we were perceived as a danger to labor and a menace to white people, you can think of the passage from the newspaper that I read, um, but after we become characterized as docile, studious, obedient as model minorities, right? Um, so the characteristics that shape the model minority myth, they weren't invented in the post-war era. And they've more or less existed since the meeting, since the meeting time between the West and the East, um, where the West encountered the East through a really kind of messy, entangled, and kind of inextricable combination of both repulsion and exotic desire. So while repulsion can, can kind of form, you know, the emotional background for practices of violent exclusion, um, erotic de desire, on the other hand, is more amenable to things like assimilation to a kind of uh, digestion of a people or a culture. So the model minority myth is, is very much Janus faced, which is the, the image of, I think it's a coin that you see on the right here, um, Janus being uh, the two faced Roman God. And I kind of mention it to expose how it, how the model minority myth um, has contrasting meanings. So on the one hand, I think we need to recognize um, the difference um, and the disparity between the advantages that um, are bestowed on people who accept the model minority myth um, and the kind of deprivations faced by other minority groups. So in, in this sense, I think our transformation into so-called model minority myths has, has been weaponized against other minority groups, as Audrey mentioned, who become villainized for their um, inability to rise to the level of economic prosperity of Japanese Canadians, really despite the fact that they haven't been given equal opportunity um, since the overwhelming approach that continues uh, to be thrown at, against many other communities is still one of violent exclusion. So this makes me think of the ways that model minority stereotype can be used to reinforce exactly the same kinds of racist stereotypes that Linda was uh, you know, really, really vividly evoking for us at, during the opening of the session. Um, and you know, on the other hand, I think we need to recognize that by internalizing the status of model minorities, we really skew our relationship to our past. So the limits of propriety of what's appropriate for an Asian person to, to do or say um, become constricted 
and kind of the range of our horizons starts to narrow. Um, so in order to hold on to our safety and prosperity, we kind of kept our heads down um, and we bite our tongues, which I think means that we have to turn a, well, we end up turning a blind eye on, on the communities that continue to experience the brunt of a lot of violence. So I wanna fast forward to the present and call our attention to, to a state of events that's kind of become all too familiar to the people gathered here. You can just kind of digest that bar chart while I, while I go on. So we've seen an acute rise in hatred directed at Asians over the course of the past two years and an upsurge uh, in reported uh, cases and consequently in an awareness over the past few months. Um, so I think this shows that the balance is kind of swinging again from model minority back to threat. Um, in the words of a critical race theorist called Christopher Chen, an Asian American, um, what we're seeing is how little a claim on economic citizenship actually protects the people who make that claim. In other words, he's pointing to the failure of the model minority myth to protect us. So we're seeing a kind of cross-contamination between the way today that COVID is characterized and the way that Asians are characterized. So both come to be seen as a kind of a hidden menace. Um, what Audrey was, was describing earlier as concealing an invisible or kind of indecipherable danger. Um, Asian American studies scholar Aiko Day calls this a toxic cognitive mapping of race, disease, and crisis. And I think this is exactly what Trump was stoking towards the end of his time in office. Um, and it goes beyond Trump. It like, you know, it resonates with, with the way that things have been, you know, all across the continent. Um, and there's obviously a kind of resonance between the before that I talked about of yellow parallelism and the, the kind of the so-called after, which is not really an after period of right now. Um, and despite the fact, yeah, because the, you know, the model minority myth is still with us here today. So characterizations of the current moment often draw parallels with the flavor of kind of uh, xenophobic populism that led to the outbreak of the Second World War. And I don't think that this is a coincidence. And I would probably bet that some of the older members of uh, the community are really wary of the similarities between the, the events of their childhood and some of the things that are taking place today. Um, but I would like us to remember, I'd like, you know, I, you know, as a member of the Japanese community, I would like us to remember at this moment that what's passed for us is an ongoing present for many other people. And that if we're going to incubate kind of a racialized consciousness and aware an awareness of the of the things that have happened to us, which I think that we should, um, that this kind of awakening has to take place with the real consideration for the very very you know substantial privileges that many Japanese Canadian people um, have gained um, and which have been you know synonymous with their economic assimilation and, and with our kind of adoption of the title of model minorities. So I think that to develop this kind of a sensibility, you know, the way that I'm kind of looking at things now um, is actually the same thing as starting to disentangle ourselves from the model minority myth. Um, so by tracing the emergence of the myth and understanding how it engages in a kind of a push and pull uh, with yellow parallelism, I think we come out with a more rounded understanding of the way that they work together to constitute what's really an important element in the experience of Japanese Canadians. So with the kind of panoramic view towards the effects of both of these kinds of racialization, I hope that we can both honor the legacies of the suffering that Asian communities have endured, while also kind of reckoning with the ways that our, you know, accession to the role of the model minority has made us complicit in the marginalization of other groups of people. So when it, when it comes to our encounter with our racialized identity, um, I wanna caution us away from adopting overly romantic ideas of what it means to be Japanese. Um, and instead to give ourselves permission um, to engage with like Japanese-ness in more irreverent ways. Um, because after all, the stereotypes about the model minority are bolstered by ideas about Japan um, as a homogenous and insular nation made up of very different and disciplined and obedient people. Um, and I, I wanna argue that this stereotype is just as much a fabrication as the model minority myth is. Um, and I'd like to read a, a short passage to end from a book called, uh, by, from a book called Sabu Koso that touches on this point. 
So he writes that Japan is a construct in the process of modernization and the widely shared assumptions that the territory of the nation state was always inhabited by a homogenous people called the Japanese is but a fiction um, in a work that effectively deconstructs the Japanness of Japanese history. Uh, history uh, historian Yoshihiko uh, Amino shows how the Eastern and Western parts of the country followed very different patterns of social, political, economic, and cultural development. So while the Western part was connected to the Southern part of the Korean peninsula, the Eastern part um, of Japan was interacted more with the Northern territories of the Asian continent. So the inhabitants of the, of the Japanese archipelago who are commonly thought of as farmers who are confined to kind of an insular territory actually included oceanic peoples who are not only fishing, but also actively trading and also pirating over the space of water along pathways from rivers to seas, among islands and isles, and between you know, the Japanese archipelago and various parts of the continent. So I want to end on this vision of a kind of broken up or fragmented core. Um, because I think that what's broken up is also available to be creatively reassembled. Um, and I believe that this kind of reassembly can be a kind of vital and joyful process as much as it also requires us to look at some ugly truth and face some deep wounds. Um, and I think of a story that I heard about uh, the Japanese uh, Japanese Canadian fishing trade at the turn of the century. So the story goes that when Japanese people first arrived uh, on these lands in British Columbia, indigenous people actually taught them how to navigate the rivers and how to catch salmon. And I, I think of how much has changed since then. And I, th I think about, you know, the health and the viability of those rivers and the ways of life that were so generally generously shared with the Japanese community at that point, and how they've been under really continual and tremendous pressure. Um, and so when I'm reacting to that kind of a situation, when I'm thinking about things like this, I can't help but think of the possibilities for, you know, coalition to do things together, to act, you know, along with other people that, that close off, um, that get foreclosed and closed off by the model minority myth. So I think that it's um, a better time than ever to work on decomposing it. And, you know, just on the Zoom call, I think that there are at least three uh, generations worth of experience and energy that can come together to form, you know, more creative, uh, more joyous, and more kind of entangled visions of what lies ahead. Um, so thank you very much. Wow, thank you, Eli. You did a really, really incredible job of drawing out the nuances of the term model minority myth, because I think encompassed within that single phrase is so much. And I really appreciate how well you brought out all the different nuances, um, especially talking about the contrast between the yellow peril, right? Like Asian communities presenting a threat versus um, later, yeah, becoming, becoming the model minority, being seen as docile and obedient, a law abiding, right? So there's really uh, <laughs> so much to look at with within this term. And um, I really appreciate everything that you shared. And also that you shared a little bit about your personal, like, you know, family background, that was great. And I wrote down one um, thing that you said, you said, what's past for us is a present for many other people. And I thought that was really well said and something that we should all be keeping in mind. So thank you so much, Eli. Thank you, Audrey, again. And this brings us to our break. So we are going to be taking a roughly five minute break. We're actually ahead of schedule, which is pretty amazing. And I'm going to be posting the breakout room questions into the chat now to give everyone some time to to start thinking through them because once we come back from the break we'll be moving right into the breakout rooms so oh my chat disappeared there it is um so here are the the questions you can start thinking about them and we will see you back here in five minutes <laughs> 